Hello, my name is Logan Klein, and for this presentation, I will be discussing The Diving Bell and the Butterfly by Jean-Dominique Babouy. This is a book that's come up a lot in our neurobiology classes so far, and I decided to explore it further for my memoir analysis. Some of the objectives for this presentation are to explore the life of Jean-Dominique Babouy and the events leading up to him writing his memoir, The Diving Bell and the Butterfly. Uh, we want to review the etiology, symptoms, and Bobby's presentation of locked-in syndrome and how it connects to physical therapy. We also want to discuss the impacts, coping mechanisms, and key lessons that Bobby learned and expressed in his memoir. And we want to discuss adaptive skills Bobby used to write his memoir and also connect these themes back to what we've discussed in our Issues in Patient Care course. Babui was born on April 23rd, 1952, and he ended up becoming the chief editor at Elle in Paris, which is a fashion magazine. Uh, he had two children, Celeste and Theophile. Uh, unfortunately, on December 5th, 1995, he suffered a stroke while he was driving with his son Theophile in the country. Um, he started complaining of seeing double pull over the car and had Theophile run for help. Turns out he was having a cerebrovascular seizure. He suffered a severed brainstem, almost completely severed. Uh, he was in a three-week coma, and then when he came out, he was diagnosed with locked-in syndrome. Uh, following the end of his coma, he was moved from Paris to the Maritime Hospital in northern France. Now, as for locked-in syndrome, it is damage to the brainstem, most commonly uh, the anterior pons. There are three subtypes, complete, incomplete, and total. Uh, complete being when you only have vertical eye movements and the ability to blink. Incomplete being when you have vertical eye movements and some voluntary function and total being complete uh, loss of voluntary movements, but still being conscious. So in total, all locked-in syndrome cases involve tetraplegia, bulbar palsy, um, whole body sensory loss, and you do maintain cognition, vertical eye movements, blinking, and hearing. Now in Babuy's case, he only had the ability to move his left eye, therefore his right eye had to be sewn shut uh, to decrease the risk of ulceration of his right cornea. Uh, he was also able to turn his head, hence why his diagnosis was labeled as incomplete. Uh, and he was deaf in his right ear, but was able to hear sounds out of his left ear as long as they were not ten, more than 10 feet away. Babouy began writing his memoir in the summer of 1996 with the help of his speech therapist. The diving bell, which he refers to in the title, is a metal dome which is used to transport divers to the ocean floor and usually weighs several tons. Babouy described the feeling of being locked in as having this diving bell on top of him. The book took about 10 months to complete and took four hours a day of work. All in all, Bobby blinked 200,000 times to complete the book. The book was published in March 7th of 1997 and was a number one bestseller in Europe. Just two days after the book was published, Bobby passed away from complications from pneumonia. Connections to physical therapy. Bobby's time at the Maritime Hospital was like many patients' stays in inpatient facilities. Throughout the book, he is visited by nurses, occupational therapists, psychologists, neurologists, speech pathologists, and physical therapists. Bridget was his physical therapist. She would come and work with him on mobilizations, or stretching his atrophied legs and arms. Bobby said that Bridget was checking for even the smallest flickers of improvement. During the book, we see Bobby struggle with his own mental health as he journeys from shock and denial early on to eventually acknowledging and adjusting to his situation. Babui also collaborates with a number of team members, including his family, caretakers, and publishers. Babui also developed coping skills to help him deal with his situation. Throughout the memoir, we see the impact of this diagnosis on Babui. Babui can no longer bathe, feed, dress, or perform any of his ADLs by himself, and he was unable to speak. During the chapter My Lucky Day, the machine that is connected to Bob Wee's feeding tube becomes detached for over a half hour and begins beeping. His sweat unglues the tape that keeps his eyelid closed, his eyelashes begin tickling his pupils unbearably, and his catheter becomes detached, spilling urine all over himself. Throughout the memoir, Bob Wee also struggles with a distorted image of himself. While imagining himself walking through the hallways of the hospital, Bob Wee sees himself in a mirror and is shocked by how grim his own appearance is so much so that he can't help but laugh at where he's at in life. Babui also goes through a lot of emotional strain. In several instances, he goes from euphoria to sadness in only a matter of seconds. 
but Lee demonstrates many of his maladaptive coping skills directly following his stroke. He describes the feeling as prolonged and refined agony. On his first return to Paris, Bob Lee weeps upon passing his old workplace. He also battles with his emotions on Father's Day. When his children come to visit, he is unable to reach out and touch them, which sends him into an emotional spiral. However, as time passes, Bob Lee's coping skills become more adaptive. His two best strategies for escaping this diving bell are traveling in his mind and communicating with those he knows through partner-assisted scanning. Using his mind, Bob Lee can remember the taste of food. He can also relive vacations and important moments of his life. He can travel to Hong Kong or visit museums or even take a walk down the hospital with the Empress Eugene. With the help of his speech pathologist, Bob Lee begins using partner-assisted scanning in order to communicate with 60 friends and associates. He sends them regular bulletins reporting on his life, progress, and hopes. And he is also even able to talk to his daughter Celeste on the phone. A transcriber would read the letters aloud to Bob Lee. When he heard the correct letter, he would blink his eye. In this rearranged alphabet, letters that were used more frequently were placed at the front, while letters that were less frequent were placed at the back. Here we find a quote of Bob Lee describing just how far his mind can travel. Some of the key lessons from this book are that life is what you make of it. Also, not all communication is verbal. Finding nonverbal communication can give a voice to those who cannot speak. Your mind can also take you places that your body cannot. And just because you are disabled doesn't mean that you can't achieve your goals. I plan on using what I learned in this memoir for my future as a physical therapist. One way is by finding effective nonverbal communication with patients. I can do this by reading patients' nonverbals or even finding alternative communication where it's necessary. I will also place importance on creating a comfortable environment for my patients, whether that be monitoring alarms, managing lines, or repositioning them. I also want to make therapy enjoyable for patients. Making it fun, going outside, involving family, these are all great ways that I can get patients more involved. In this memoir, Bob Lee was able to overcome his diagnosis and create something inspiring for others. Despite initially having some maladaptive coping strategies, Bob Lee developed strong strategies in order to cope with his diagnosis. Bob Lee found that the mind can take you places even when your body cannot. He was also able to find alternative ways to accomplish his goals within his abilities. Being aware of Bob Lee's struggles can help us improve our own practice as physical therapists. Some key takeaways of this book are to be aware of people's nonverbals, to recognize whether their coping skills are maladaptive or adaptive and how that can influence their situation, and also to not take things for granted in life. Anything is possible with hard work, practice, and determination. As for my review of the book, I have found that it is a very short read and only took a few days for me to complete. It's an inspiring story of a man showcasing a strong mind despite his physical limitations. I would highly recommend Bob Wee's memoir. The Diving Bell of the Butterfly was adapted to a film in 2007 and was nominated for four Oscars. It's a short 107 minute watch and you can watch it for free on Pluto.